The book of Revelation chapter 21, verse five. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. All right, I want to give all praises, honor, and glory to Yahweh, Bahashem Yahweh Shai, Bahashem Rahah Wadash, double honest to the apostles and elders of Great Millstone, and Shalom to the whole full elect. So today I want to go into how we need to be very specific, okay? You have a lot of people that realize that we're in the last days. You have a lot of people that have come to the, the awakening that the media is lying to you, all right? Everything's satanic. The government is your enemy. And so anyone with any bit of wisdom, they're seeking refuge in the scriptures. So you have a lot of people saying they believe. Uh, I'm a true believer. I believe in the Bible. It, it's easy to say you believe in the Bible when you're only quoting random Psalms. You know, the Lord is my shepherd. He knows what I want or you're quoting Proverbs. You know, the, the Bible is full of actionable advice, it's full of wholesome words, it's full of sound doctrine. So anyone can say they believe in the Bible, but if you notice, when we actually read the words that are written in the Bible, very few people believe. In fact, most people actually scoff, they hate the word, they hate the commandments, all right? They hate the laws, they hate the prophecies, they hate the Lord having a chosen people. So when someone says they believe in the Bible, let's be very specific. What part of the Bible do you actually believe in? Because only, the Lord is only looking for true believers, as it tells you in John. All right, let, let me get that real quick before I continue. Because I want to go into two words today specifically. Uh, let me get this real quick. This is the gospel according to St. John, chapter 4, verse 23. It says, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Right, the Father, the Most High, Yahweh, he, seek, he seeks for true men that worship in truth and in spirit. Not someone that says, oh, I believe in Jesus, I believe in, you know, again, anyone could say they believe in the Bible if you cherry pick certain uh, scriptures that make you feel good. If you cherry pick certain scriptures that make you feel like, oh, I turned my life around for Christ. Okay, but what about what the Bible's actually talking about, the actual narrative of the scriptures? Now, I wanna go into two words today. I have time to get both. But uh, the two words I wanna go into today are guarantee and historicity because a guarantee is something that the most high gave to his chosen people the israelites and when you read the bible you can clearly see that these people don't believe in the guarantee of the word of the most high all right and then you have the word historicity let me get that as well all right let me get let me start with guarantee it says guarantee a formal promise typically in writing that certain conditions will be fulfilled let me read that again guarantee a formal promise, typically in writing, that certain conditions will be fulfilled. And what is the Holy Bible? It's a guarantee. It's a, a list of promises in writing to the 12 tribes of Israel. And the majority of people that say they believe in the Bible, they don't believe in the guarantees written in the Bible. They believe in a religion called Christianity, which is found nowhere in the scriptures. And the second word I wanna get is historicity. It says, Historicity is the historical actuality of persons and events, meaning the quality of being part of history instead of being a historical myth, legend, or fiction. The historicity of a claim about the past is its factual status. Historicity denotes historical actuality, authenticity, factuality, and focuses on the true value of knowledge claims about the past. So in other words, historicity is the uh, the historical accuracy of something, something being historically uh, authentic, in other words. Now, when you go into uh, so-called believers, believers of Christianity, they say they believe in the Bible, but then they'll bring up the Big Bang Theory, they'll bring up evolution, they'll bring up uh, evolutionary psychology. These people don't actually believe in the historicity of the scriptures. They don't believe in, in Adam and Eve, they don't believe in Noah and his three sons, they don't believe in the nation of Israel having 12 tribes, they, they believe in, in, in new speak, and madness, total perverse uh, false science. So in order to tr truly believe in the Bible, you have to believe in, in the guarantees, the promises made to Israel, and you have to believe in the historicity. You have to believe that the, the historical events spoken of in the scriptures actually took place. Now, the majority of people that say they so-called believe in the Bible, they don't believe in either one of these things. So are they true believers? Are they the believers that Yahweh Shai and, and his father are speaking for in, a, in St. John the fourth chapter? No, these are just, they're pretenders. All right, there are people that are living under a facade, people that are, that are using the scriptures, uh, cherry picking certain scriptures that make them feel good, but they don't believe in, in basic precepts. Let me, let's start here. Because for you to say you believe in the Bible, but then you, you say you, you believe in evolution, your, your grandfather's a rat, okay, your great-great-grandfather is some type of, of mouse, or, or we, we descend from bacteria over billions of years, we, 
That's completely against the script. You don't believe in the scriptures. You believe in madness. But I want to start with the promises because this is the foundation of our faith, that the Most High is going to send back His only begotten Son to fulfill His word, what He, what he promised us. Remember, a guarantee is a promise in writing. This is the book of Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. It says, And I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now, this is a, a promise that the Most High made to Abraham and his seed. Now, we know that the 12 tribes of Israel have been attacked and, and maimed, assaulted, and, and ultimately enslaved by all the nations on the earth. Now, when did the Most High curse those nations for what they did to his chosen people? When does that happen? Okay, it's a guarantee that it's going to happen, but it hasn't happened yet. So, if you believe in the Bible, at some point you have to be looking for the judgment of the heathen. You have to be looking for the recompense and, and the ransom for the 12 tribes of Israel. And I, I've never heard a Christian say, you know what, I can't wait till these Moabites get it, man. I can't wait till these Edomites get what they deserve. They, these people don't care about the, the, the nations that came against Israel being cursed and destroyed. That's something that we believe because we're the true believers. We believe in the actual words that are written in the scriptures. This is another promise. This is uh, one chapter over. This is Genesis 13 and 14. And Yahweh said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward. So look, look north, look, look, you know, south, east, west, look, look everywhere your eyes see. It says, for all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land and the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. So there was a land that was promised to the, the actual Israelites. Now, when you go into the, the secular world, you have a group of heathen that are calling themselves Jewish. They're claiming that they're the rightful uh, owners of our land, but they don't fit any of the prophecies. They don't fit the biblical description of the Israelites. They, they're not under curses that the Israelites will be under. They're, they're just a group of imposters. And people claim to believe in the scriptures and they're okay with this. But the scriptures tell you that the Most High actually promised Abraham and his seed that that land would go to his chosen people. And that's one of the things that he promised us. <clears throat> that's one of the things that we look forward to. This is another promise. This is the book of Jeremiah, chapter 32, verse 37. Behold, I will gather them out of all countries whither I have driven them in mine anger and in my fury and in great wrath and I will bring them again unto this place, that same place from Genesis, the 13th chapter that he promised Abraham, all right, the Holy Land, and I will cause them to dwell safely, and they shall be my people, and I will be their power, and I will give them one heart and one way, that they may fear me forever, for the good of them and of their children after them. So this is talking about the new covenant, all right, that's another promise. The Most High promised that he would write his laws into our inward parts and make us perfect. That hasn't happened yet, and that's something we're looking forward to. Now you ask the average Christian, are you looking forward to the laws, statutes, and commandments being written in your inward parts? These people actually think that the laws are evil. They think that the law is done away with. Oh, that was the Old Testament. They don't even believe that the laws are good, let alone something that should be written in our inward parts. These people are total hypocrites and they're frauds. So we have to be very specific when we say this person believes in the Bible. All right, do you really? Do you believe in this? It says, yea, I will rejoice Oh, so like it, verse 40, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts that they should not depart from me. Yea, I will rejoice over them to do them good, and I will plant them in this land assuredly with my whole heart and with my whole soul. For thus saith Yahweh, like as I have brought all this great evil upon this people, so will I bring upon them all the good that I have promised them. Let me read that again. For thus saith Yahweh, like as I have brought all this great evil upon this people, right, the, the Most High brought evil upon us. When you read Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, verse 15, all the way on down to 68, that's a great evil that he promised that he would do to our people. And he did it. Every single verse, every single curse. He did that to his chosen people because we disobeyed him. So it says, for thus saith the Lord Yahweh, like as I have brought all this great evil upon this people, so will I bring upon them all the good that I have promised them. So he promised us a great good, all right? He promised us a, a great evil if we disobeyed him. He said if we repent and come back unto him, he will promise us a great good, and that's what's coming. Now, again, does Christianity mention 
the, the new covenant for the 12 tribes of Israel being placed in their own land and having the curses go upon our enemies. When have you ever heard a pastor talk about the, the Edomites are gonna get what's coming to them? You never hear that. When do you hear about the 12 tribes being gathered out of all lands and come, going back to the Holy Land? You got, you got these Edomites claiming to be Jews. They're claiming to be one tribe. Where are the other 11 tribes? Aren't those your brothers? Don't you need them back in the homeland to fulfill prophecy? I don't, you don't even hear Jewish people talking about, oh, I'm looking for Naphtali, I'm looking for Manasseh, I'm looking for my brother's Issachar. They, they don't even care. They don't care about the Bible. They don't care about the promises. It says, matter of fact, let me, let me go uh, one verse over because this is another promise. This is Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 14. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised which I have promised unto the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. And that's talking about Yahawashai, right? He comes from the seed of David, the sperm line of David. It says, in those days shall Judah be saved and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she shall be called Yahweh, our righteousness. Let me skip down to verse 20. It says, thus saith the Lord Yahweh, if ye can break my covenant of the day and my covenant of the night, and that there should not be day and night in their season, then may also my covenant be broken with David my servant, that he should not have a son to reign upon his throne, and with the Levites the priests my ministers. As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measured, so will I multiply the seed of David my servant and the Levites that minister unto me. So if you could do away with the sun and the night, all right, the day and the night, the sun and the moon. If you could do away with these things, then he'll do away with his covenant that he made unto his servant David. Now, last time I checked, there's still day and night, which means what? That promise is still good. So how are you following a religion that doesn't address the promises made to the 12 tribes of Israel? Again, where in Christianity do you hear mention of the throne of David, the 12 tribes sitting on thrones governing the world? I've never heard a Christian mention that. The first time I ever heard about the throne of David was listening to the Israelites. The first time I heard about the 12 tribes uh, ruling the earth in righteousness, that was from men of the Lord preaching out of the scriptures, man. All right, these, these sweaty Baptist niggas, all right, with the bald head, all right, they get up there and they, they tell a story about, you know, their Chrysler or, or some, some madness they went through when they were younger. And again, the Lord knows what I want, he's my shepherd. They get up there and put on a show and they'll, they'll cherry pick certain scriptures, but they don't believe in the, the promises. They don't believe in the guarantee, the promise in writing given to the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, some of you would think, oh yeah, well that, that was the Old Testament. You, you read from Jeremiah, that was the Old Testament. That was done away with. Jesus, you know, let, let's get the, the so-called New Testament, which even that is against the promises, okay? The actual, there's one Testament, all right? There, there was a clause that we would break, all right, the commandments and then need a redeemer. That was already written from the beginning. There is no new doctrine that our Lord and Savior came up with 2000 years ago. Everything he did was to fulfill what was already written. All right, Moses predicted all of this. Yahweh came to fulfill it. So this idea that, that the old and the new are at variance with one another, that's not in the scriptures. But this is the book of Romans, chapter nine, verse four. Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of the Most High and the promises. And the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Hamashiach came who is over all, God bless forever, amen. So the promises are to the Israelites according to the flesh. Now that's Apostle Paul, all right, you can get it in the red letters, Yahweh is saying the same thing, John saying the same thing, Peter, all right, all of the apostles, they know that the promises are to the 12 tribes of Israel, all right? The promises were made to our forefathers and they extend on down to us to this day. Matter of fact, since I'm in Romans, let me get this real quick. This is the book of Romans chapter 15, verse four, it says, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope, right? The things that were written aforetime are the laws, statutes and commandments and the history, all right? The historicity is included in the scriptures, all right? What happened to us uh, during the times of King David, King Solomon, all right, all of the Chronicles, Kings, that's our actual history. That's the history of the nation of Israel. And then you have the history of the Babylonians, all right, the Persians, the Greeks, all right, the Romans, that's all documented in the scriptures. 
those things that were written aforetime were written for our learning today because there's nothing but lies being prol proliferated in these last days. So we have to have something that's true. We have to have something that's, that's ironclad, something that can't be broken, something that can't be tampered with. Now you can mistranslate the Bible. You can come up with your own spin of the Bible, but the actual words themselves, they're faithful and true. They don't change. So that's, that's grounded to us. And it was written so that we could have comfort and through patience. It says, now the power of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another, according to Mashiach Yahawashai, that ye might with one mind, with one mind and one mouth glorify the Most High, even the Father of our Lord Yahawashai Mashiach. Wherefore, receive ye one another, as a Mashiach also received us to glory of the Most High. Now I say that Yahawashai Mashiach was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of Yahweh to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. So Yahawashai's sacrifice was to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. And those promises are a guarantee. So if he went on the cross to, let me read that again. It says, now I say that Yahawashai Mashiach was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of Yahweh to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. So there's no promise made to our fathers that we're gonna be equal with a Moabite, that we're gonna be equal with the heathen. So when you look at the doctrine of Christianity, they, they worship an idol that was that's a savior for the heathen. They worship an idol that came to bring all nations together. That's not a promise that was made to our fathers. The Lord and Savior of the Bible, Yahweh Shai Mashiach, who these heathen called Jesus, he actually went up on the cross to confirm the promises made to our fathers, the Israelites. It says, matter of fact, let me, let me just get it real quick. This is uh, the gospel according to St. Luke chapter 1 verse 68 it says blessed be the lord god of israel all right yahweh for he had visited and redeemed his people the israelites and have raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant david that same servant that the most high made a promise all right it says as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets which have been since the world began and one of the prophets prophesied of of christianity one of the prophets prophesied of all the nations coming together and holding hands the prophecies include the house of David ruling. The, prophe the prophecies include the, the kingdom of heaven, all right, the Israelites ruling. It says that we should be saved from our enemies, not with, from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us to perform the mercy promised to us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. And what was his holy covenant? We just read it, all right? So if if Yahweh Shai, his, his coming is to perform the, the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, you have to believe in the covenant, okay? You can't say, I believe in the Bible, but you don't believe in the covenant and the promises made to our fathers, which is all Christianity is. All Christianity is, is a distraction where they cherry pick scriptures and completely ignore the promises to the 12 tribes of Israel. It says, the oath which he swear to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. Now notice these are all possessive pronouns. His people, their sins. This is about the Israelites, okay? The Messiah came to fulfill the promises made to our fathers, again, another possessive word, to, to for the remission of our sins, meaning the word remit means to send back, okay? You have the prefix re, and then you have mit, which means to send. This is where you get the word missile, all right? To remit something means to send it back. So Yahweh Shai died to send back the sins of the nation of Israel and for us to receive salvation so that we could receive the mercy promised to our fathers. That's the narrative of the scriptures. You can get it in Job, you can get it in Jeremiah, Isaiah, you can get it in Romans, Luke. All right, we're just, we're reading the gospels right here. So where in the gospels does it say the Lord came to, to fulfill some other promise that was never made? How do you fulfill a guarantee that was never given to anybody? How, you can't do that in the world. You can't say, well, look, I, I bought this, I bought this flat screen, you know, on the side of the road from some nigga, you know, but I'm gonna go to Best Buy and you have to honor this guarantee. You, you were never given a guarantee. That, you didn't get that TV from us. What are you talking about? All right, that doesn't work anywhere. But people wanted to work with the scriptures. You wanna, you wanna hold the, he the Heavenly Father hostage to, hold, to, to basically fulfill a promise that he never made to you. The Most High never promised you heathen salvation. Why would... <laughs> Let me read this again. This is a... Uh... 
Yeah, verse 71, Luke 1 and 71, that we should be saved from our enemies, not with our enemies. Why would the Most High put us in the hand of our enemies for, for going off and mingling with the heathen and then save us with the heathen? That doesn't make any sense whatsoever, but that's the doctrine of this world. That's a doctrine that, you know, people would like to be, they would, they would like that to be true because they could just discount the Israelites. They could just throw us aside. Oh, God loves everybody now. John 3, 16. John 3, 16 is not talking about everybody, man. That's talking about the world of Israel. This is a, uh, matter of fact, while I'm in Luke, let me get this because our, our gospel is completely different from the gospel of Christianity. Our gospel is based on the words written in the Bible, the guarantee, the promises and the guarantee written in the scriptures. This is Luke chapter four, verse 17. And there was delivered unto him, Yahweh Shai, the Messiah, there was a book delivered unto him of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives. Salakia. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. So this is Yahweh reading from Isaiah the 61st chapter and he closed the book. So what does that mean? Does that mean he doesn't believe in the rest of Isaiah 61? He just believed in that one phrase? No, he was reading the gospel and he closed the book. What, what does Isaiah 61 say? Let's get it. It's the book of Isaiah chapter 61, verse one. It says, the spirit of the Lord Yahweh is upon me because Yahweh have anointed me to preach good tidings, which is the gospel, unto the meek. He had sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of Yahweh. This is where Yahweh shall stop reading and he closed the book. But this is what it says when you keep reading. It says, to proclaim the acceptable year of Yahweh and the day of vengeance, and the day of vengeance of our power to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes. So Yahweh Shai, he quoted this as the gospel. The gospel is the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our power, and to comfort those that mourn in Zion. There's no scripture where the Lord promised comfort to Moab, to Edom, all right, to Ham, to Ishmael, the Most High never promised comfort to the heathen. He promised destruction to them. That's all throughout the scripture. So again, when someone says, I believe in the Bible, do you believe in the day of vengeance? Or do you just believe in comforting words? Because the elect of the nation of Israel, the hopeful elect, we're comforted by knowing that there's gonna be a violent end to all of this madness. We're comforted by knowing that everything that the heathen put our people through, they're gonna go through it as well. And, and the Edomites are gonna get doubled, all right? They're gonna get twofold. So that comforts us. I've never heard a Christian say they're comforted by, you know, he that leadeth into captivity. Let's get that next. Because the scripture describes that as what? The patience and faith of the saints? Is that the patience and faith of your pastor, of your grandmother, of all these people that claim to believe in the Bible? Are they comforted by this? This is the book of Revelation, chapter 13 and nine. It says, if any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So the patience and faith of the saints is that those that killed us are gonna be killed. Those that enslaved us are going into slavery. That's our hope, that's our, that's our faith. And it's all throughout the scriptures. Again, this is, this is the, uh, the good news. This is back in Isaiah 2, Salakia, Isaiah 61 verse two. To proclaim the acceptable year of Yahweh and the day of vengeance of our power to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of Yahweh, that he might be glorified. And they shall build the old waste, they shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. And strangers, the other nations, the heathen, okay, the other 17 nations that are not part of the covenant, it says, and strangers, shall stand and feed your flocks and the sons of the alien shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. So our servants are gonna be the heathen. Yes, all nations are gonna be in the kingdom of heaven, but all nations aren't gonna be ruling. All nations damn sure are gonna be equal. All right, it says the sons of the alien shall be your plowmen. Meaning 
the, the Moabites, the Hamites, these are going to be the people that work for us. The same way we built up their kingdoms, they're going to build up the kingdom of heaven. And that's a promise. This is a guarantee in writing. So when you say, I believe in the Bible, do you believe in the promises? Do you believe in the guarantees? It says, but ye shall be named the priests of Yahweh. Men shall call you the ministers of our power. Ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory shall ye boast yourselves. For your shame shall ye have double, and your confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. And that's a promise, man. That is a guarantee, a promise written in, in writing. A promise in writing is a guarantee. So the Most High said what? Write? He told John the Revelator, write this. this these words are faithful and true. He told Jeremiah, look, everything that, that I put in this book, uh, everything that I give you, write it down in a book. And that's what, that's what a, a guarantee is. It's a promise written down. And that's what we have in the Holy Scriptures, man. So if someone's saying they believe in the Bible, but they don't believe in the promises, they don't believe in the guarantees, do they really believe in the Scriptures? No, they just they just want to hear something that makes them feel good. They want to hear they they read the Bible for the same reason they do drugs. They need a distraction from reality. All right, their their idea of a gospel is something that takes their mind off of the impending doom and destruction that's obviously coming to this place. They're using the scriptures as an opioid, as a as a distraction from sobriety. We're we're reading the scriptures because it gives us hope and faith in the world to come. All right, Christianity doesn't even deal with the world to come. They deal with with a uh, you know, when you die, you go to the pearly gates and you're floating and, and you know, the, the Jesus Bon Jovi, the, the so-called white man with the with the lassie hair, he's up at the pearly gates. He's got he's got your grandma there. She's smiling. He's got your dog that died when you were seven. That's what these Edomites think of when they, they talk about heaven. When we talk about heaven, we're talking about a new rulership of the earth. All right. That's what's promised to us, man. And you, you niggas that know you're Israelites and you don't care about what's been promised to you. You're going to die the death of the circumcision. Now, through the spirit, uh, Abba Ratzai, that point has been made. So, first of all, one of the most important things when you say you believe in the Bible, you have to believe in the promises that were given to, to us. Now, I want to get into the historicity because historicity is actually, it, it's one of those things where it, it clearly divides people who, who actually believe in the Bible and people who are just paying lip service. Because one thing you notice, you have a lot of so-called Christians that when you bring up certain events in the Bible, they act like, oh, that, that's a that's an allegory. That didn't really happen. Oh, that's, you know, um, I, I believe in Genesis and I believe in evolution. I believe in, uh, I think God was behind the Big Bang. They, they actually believe in the false science of this world, but they're using the Bible as a veneer of, of being moral, of being righteous. But they're actual historical events in the scriptures. And, and it starts with believing that the people on the earth today descend from the patriarchs in the Bible. All people on the earth come from... Uh, matter of fact, let me get this real quick. Let's start with... Before we get into Genesis, let's start with Ecclesiastes because this is straight into the point. This is the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 4, verse 16. It says, There is no end of the people, even all that have been before them. They also that come after shall not rejoice in them. So there's no end of the people. There's no end to the Israelites. There's no end to the Moabites. There's no end to the sons of Ham. There's no end to, to, uh, to Ishmael, all right? The, the nations in the Bible are still on the earth today, but they've been renamed, okay? You have uh, Ishmael, his sons have been renamed Arabs. Arab is a Hebrew word that means mixture. So Esau, the so-called white man, he took a group of people and just said, hey, y'all are a mixture of people, all right? So when you look at, uh, for, for example, Moab, Today, they're known as so-called Chinese people, but they're still a nation. They're a very populous nation, but they go back to the Bible, right? Everyone in the scriptures goes back to a patriarch mentioned in Genesis, the 10th chapter. Let's, let's get that real quick. And this is, this is actual historicity. This isn't, these aren't, somebody just sat down and wrote a book. Okay, I'm going to write Adam. I'm going to write Eve. I'm going to write Moab. I'm going to write Jacob. No, these are actual men that existed. And from their loins comes everyone that you see here today. All of these people uh, hogging up traffic. They all descend from biblical patriarchs. This is the book of Genesis, chapter 10, verse 1. It says, Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them were the sons born after the flood. So after the flood, when the Lord killed every baby on the earth, or he killed everyone except eight people. You had four men. You had Noah, his three sons, which we just read, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and then you had their wives. That, that was eight people that survived a global flood. And that was an event that took place. That actually happened. And you have people that claim to believe in the Bible, that claim to be Christian, but they don't even believe that a flood took place. 
they believe that the flood is like an allegory and a metaphor. For, no, there was an actual, there was a literal global event where everyone on the earth died except eight people. And Noah, who was the son of God, so he had dominion over the animals. He actually controlled the animals and had them come into the ark. And he preserved a specific amount so that they can reproduce and repopulate the earth. That actually happened. That was a historical event that took place. And after it took place, all of the descendants of, of, uh, of Noah, they have their own version of the flood because it actually happened. Or you have the so-called scholars, well, different cultures have different flood myths. It's not a myth. These, these are eyewitness accounts. People actually watched the earth get flooded and then they came off of the ark and they repopulated the earth. That actually took place. And then the descendants of those men, they're, they're the people that you see today. All right, this wasn't billions of years ago. This was a few thousand years ago. It doesn't take that long to make uh, 8 billion people, all right? You can, you can double the population of the earth in one generation. All you need is a little quality time, man. You just need to be left to, uh, you know, men and women need to be left to their own devices, all right? The earth, uh, it repopulates very quickly. So this idea that we've been here for billions of years and the earth, the, the flood is just a myth, that's, that's false, man. All right, when you look at every, uh, the, the tallest mountains in the world, they're all covered with what? Sedentary rock. They're all covered with rocks that were made in the ocean. So how did, how did water get thousands of feet up in the air? Because there was a global flood. There's no other scientific explanation for, like, Jay, what's crazy is people claim to believe in science. They claim to be uh, logical, free-thinking people and all of this madness, but then you ask them straightforward questions. Okay, how is this scientifically possible? If the earth is so many years old, if the earth is billions of years old, why are there still hills and valleys? Everything would have been washed away by now. You can see, how quickly things corrode. All right, mountains corrode a few inches every year. So if the earth was billions of years old, there wouldn't be any mountains, there wouldn't be any hills. But you ask these people that, they're like, all they do is, is regurgitate and parrot things that they heard from the so-called white man. They don't think critically and their, their thought process is not based on the Holy Scriptures. So they have a cogitation that's completely turned against the Heavenly Father and righteousness. But the historicity of the Scriptures is this. It says, it says, now these, are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them were sons born after the flood. And as you read down Genesis, the 10th chapter, it gives, you, it gives you a list of all the men that the Lord used to divide the nations, to create different races. Okay, race, according to the scriptures, is not based on a phenotype. It's not based on your skin color. It's not based on how wide your nose is, how, how kinky your hair is. It's based on a lineage. You can have one man that has children from women of different nations, and those, those children all descend from the same seed. They're the same race. Your race is based on your lineage according to the scriptures. Now, this world teaches you that a person can be mixed race, which is complete nonsense. If you can mix races, that means that there is no race. If a person could be one race and another race, that means everybody on the planet is a mixture of different races. So there, what, what's the point of a race? If, you're, if this person right here is 50% black, which there's no such thing as a black person, if they're 50% black and 50% white, and their children, they have children with somebody else who's 25% black and 75% white, then their son is like 33.7% this, 17.8% Hawaiian, that, that's complete madness, man. That is total madness. There's no such thing as a, a, a mixed breed person. Everyone comes from one seed. You can't be from two different seeds. That's not... That's not physically possible, that's not biologically possible, and most importantly, it's not scriptural. That's not dealing with the historicity of the Bible. The Bible deals with patriarchs having children with different women, and then those descendants still being on the earth. As we read in Ecclesiastes 4, there's no end of the people. So everybody that you read in Genesis the 10th chapter, they're still here. They're just going by a different name, all right? And if you have the Holy Spirit, you can see, okay, this is, this is what the scriptures say the Edomites will be doing in the last days. This is the, the uh, the depiction of, of Edomites, their, their characteristics, their spirit. How do they move? What, what are they good at? What are they not good at? What would they be blessed with? What is their nature? What is their true nature? And you could clearly see these are Edomites. It's not even rocket science, man. You know, you have certain, uh, certain random heathen, you'd be like, well, who, who is that today? It doesn't even matter, you know? <laughs> you got 17 nations, you can clearly see who Edom is. You can clearly see who Jake is. And those, that's the main protagonist and the antagonist of the scriptures, all right? Any, any good movie, you got a good guy and a bad guy. Why would the Holy Bible be any different? You have Jacob, all right, he's the hero. He, he's, he's down and out for most of the movie. And then at the climax of the movie, what happens? He gets that, he gets that second win, he bounces back. It's a, a true underdog story, all right? And that's, that's actual history, all right? Now, this is, 
Oh, that's the spirit. I had this next. This is this is actually the story of Jacob and Esau. And this is a uh, you have a lot of scholars, so-called uh, self-proclaimed scholars. They'll try to say that this is this is a, a parable, or this is this represents good and evil. No, this is actual a literal account of what happened. Now there are allegories to be made. There are spiritual lessons to come from this. It is a battle of good and evil. But these are men that actually existed. This is the Book of Genesis, chapter 25, verse 21. It says, "And Isaac entreated Yahweh for his wife, because she was barren, and Yahweh was entreated of him." And Rebekah, his wife, conceived, and the children struggled together within her. And she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of Yahweh. And Yahweh said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And this actually happened. All right, our, our forefather, his wife, when she was pregnant with Jacob and Esau, that she had birth, uh, she had pains in her womb, meaning the twins were inside of her, her belly fighting. Why? Because they were enemies. It says, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. So it was prophesied that whichever, whoever comes out first, all right, whichever twin, whichever fraternal twin is first, he's going to serve the one that comes out second. Now let's see, let's see who comes out first. Verse 24, And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb, and the first came out red all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau, which Esau in, in the Hebrew is Ishashua, which means wasted away. Wasted away is he. He is wasted. All right, he was born with no pigment. He was born red all over. So everybody on the earth was normal. They had, they had brown skin. They had pigment. They had melanin. You have a baby that came out first, and he was red. They were like, he's, he's wasted away. So they called him Esau. All right, now who... Who today gives birth to red babies? What nation on the earth has red children? All right, you have these devils. They call the so-called Native Americans red people. They're not red. Native Americans, they range from copper tone to a, a light brown to a dark brown. All right, the so-called Native Americans are brown-skinned people, like every other normal person. All right, the only red people are you Edomites, man. And you have some of y'all that are so red that you're damn near orange, like Donald Trump. Okay, he's a he came out orange all over, man. You, you devils are actually the same color of blood because you don't have melanin so you can see we can see right through your skin you're like inside out boy you can see straight through an edomite and see the blood that's in their veins man they're red they're born red and they die red it says the first came out red all over like a hairy garment and they call his name esau and after that came his brother out and his hand took hold on esau's heel and his name was called jacob and Isaac was three score years old when she bare them, and the boys grew. Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. Now, again, there, there is a battle against good and evil, all right? Jacob and Esau, it does represent a battle between the righteous and the wicked, but these are actual literal people. There's a historicity that deals with the forefather of so-called Negroes, Latinos, and Native Americans, which is Jacob and the forefather of you so-called white people, which is Esau, all right? Jacob's name was changed to Israel, all right? Israel is, he is a prince of the power. Uh, Esau's name was changed to Edom, which means red, okay? He came out red all over, all right? Esau is Edom, okay? It tells you that in Genesis, the 36th chapter. Jacob is Israel, Esau is Edom. So they're descendants of Jacob and Esau that are still on this earth to this day. And both of those nations are really the most important nations on the earth right now. All right. Despite what you might have heard about, you know, the United Nations, the UN summit and all this madness, there's really two important nations. All right. The righteous, which is you people of so-called Negro and native Indian descent, the 12 tribes of Israel. We're the righteous. We're a righteous nation. And then you have the wicked. These self-proclaimed white people. All right. They're clearly the wicked. All right. They're the only people that are trying to destroy creation. They're the only people that paint themselves to be the most high while teaching you that the most high doesn't exist. So here it is. They teach that God isn't real, but if he is real, he's white. How, think about how demonic that is, man. I don't believe in God, but I'm going to portray him as, as me, looking like me. I'm going to portray his son as looking like me. I'm going to have his chosen people look like a bunch of leprous dogs, man. Why would the Lord's chosen people be allergic to the sun when the Holy Land is in the, in, <laughs> it's in the Mesopotamia, man? What, why? <laughs> How's a, how's a chosen people going to be indigenous to a land where the sun is attacking them every day? That's why so-called Jewish people, they have the highest rates of skin cancer. Why? Because they don't belong in that land. That's, that's clearly not theirs. They're imposters. 
All right, now this is, this is another example of historicity. This is the book of Daniel, chapter eight, verse five. It says, and as I was considering, behold, and a he goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And the he goat, the, the notable he goat is talk, talking about Alexander the Greek. This is a person that actually existed. All right, for people saying, oh, nobody in the Bible existed. The Bible isn't real. The Bible is a fairy tale. The Bible is a book full of made up characters. Is Alexander the Greek made up? All right, he clearly existed. And it, it, he was prophesied hundreds of years, not thousands. He was prophesied hundreds of years before he was born. It says, and he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river and ran into him in the fury of his power. And that ram with two horns is talking about the Persians and the Medes. That was the empire that was ruling at the time when Alexander the Greek was on the scene. And he caught, what he's gonna say. It says, and I saw him come close unto the ram and he was moved with choler against them. And he smote the ram and break his two horns. And there was no power in the ram to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. So this is talking about the Greek empire uh, conquering the Medio Persians. This is something that was prophesied hundreds of years again, hundreds of years before it happened, but it's actual history. There's a historicity that comes with this. So anyone saying that the Bible, you know, the people in the Bible aren't real, this is, this is as real as it gets, okay? What we learn in the world, what you learn in school, what I learned in high school was a total lie. They teach you that, uh, the Greek Empire was the first civilization. The white man created civilization. They teach you that Christopher Columbus discovered America. They teach you that the, uh, George Washington could never tell a lie. It, George Washington, first of all, he was a Freemason and a, a serial slave rapist with wooden teeth, man. He, he was a Freemason devil, man. But the, the point is this, the actual history of the world is documented in the Holy Scriptures, all right? The so-called white man did not invent civilization. The Greeks were not the first empire. The Greeks took down the Medio Persian Empire. So how, how are you the first civilization if you conquered another civilization before you? They don't teach you about the Medes and the Persians. At least I, I didn't. I went to a so-called good school, all right? One of the better schools in New Orleans. And I learned nothing but lies, man. You learn that, that uh, before the white man came into power, everybody was just walking around. They, they barely had wheels. Uh, the white man had to invent fire. He had to invent this, invent that. And before him, people were just, they died at the age of 12. N nobody could read. There was no writing. No and then, then along came the, the great white man. He, he created democracy and he, he freed everybody and saved everybody. You, you learn a narrative which is completely false. The scriptures have the actual, you have the Babylonian empire, you have the, Pers the Persians, the Medes, all right, you have the Greeks, the Romans, you have the ancient Egyptians, you have actual empires that ruled the earth prior to the so-called white man. And that's documented in the scriptures, all right? Now, when you look at most religions, they, they document things that make them look good, okay? Even the Egyptians, they, they rewrote a lot of their papyruses. This is why no historian takes any of them seriously because they would just lie and make things up. The Greeks did the same thing. They would, they would uh, have records, and then this doesn't look favorable. Somebody else will come into power. Okay, let me, let me besmirch this person's name. Let me make them look evil since they're my enemy. All right, that's where you get that, that phrase, history is written by the victors. But the scriptures are written by, by the meek, okay? The Bible doesn't paint the Israelites to be perfect. All right, even our great king, King David, man, his sins are documented in the scriptures. Yahawashai, when he was Solomon, all right? Yahawashai is the word, first of all, so he could have easily just had Solomon be completely perfect. He could have had Adam, just written Adam to be this. No, man, the, all of our sins are ever before us. The history of the nation of Israel, not just the good side, not just the side that makes us favorable, but also our sins, our transgressions, our folly, it's all documented in the scriptures because this is real, this is the truth, okay? All these other nations, when they document their history, they, again, they try to make George Washington seem like a, oh, the founding fathers of America. These people were a bunch of degenerates, they were perverts, they were sodomites, they were Freemasons, all right, they were atheists, all right, they didn't believe in the scriptures, they weren't righteous men. But when you go to school, when you go to public school, you learn a fake history, you learn a fake version of reality. The scriptures have the good, bad, and the ugly. Why? Because this is the real history of the earth. It says, therefore, the he goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. And that actually happened. That's actual history. First of all, the four notable ones is talking about uh, Lycomachus or Lycomachus, however you want to pronounce it, uh, Cassander, you had Seleucid, and you had Ptolemy. Those were, were four men that went 
to, to rule the known world, man. That actually happened. That happened in history, but it's written in Daniel the eighth chapter. Hundreds of years, but listen, this, this book was moved. It was inspired by holy men that were moved with the Holy Spirit. How, how could a man just sit down and write, okay, somebody's gonna take down the Persians and the, you understand, anytime an empire is in power, nobody believes that it could be taken down. Look, look at the average American today. They, they have no, as weak as our military is, as thin and stretched out as the military is, as bold and powerful as our enemies become, the average American, even people around the world, they, they can't fathom a world in which America is not the dominant uh, empire, okay? That's how it was in Persia. That's how it was in Rome. Nobody thought Rome would ever fall, man. That's, that's unheard of. But the Bible speaks of the downfall of great kingdoms. It tells you in Jeremiah, let's get it. It's an oldie but goodie. It's the book of Jeremiah, chapter 28. And verse 8, it says, The prophets that have been before me and before thee of old prophesied both against against many countries and against great kingdoms of war and of evil and of pestilence and nobody but the prophets prophesies against great kingdoms everybody that's in a kingdom thinks that that kingdom is gonna just live on forever that's how people think man that's a natural way of viewing the world because that's that's who's in power and when you don't have faith and you don't have understanding of who who's in control of these authorities who sets up these powers who is in dominion over the principalities if you don't understand that Yahweh Bashem Yahweh Shai is in control of all things then it's natural for you to believe, okay, this is going to last forever. We have the strongest military. We have the strongest economy. We're going to stay in, in rulership forever. But Daniel prophesied against the, per the Persians and the Medes. And he told you, not only did he tell you about Alexander the Greek, he told you about his four generals, man. That's in the scriptures. That is, that is historicity. That is an actual, let me get that, that word historicity again. It says, historicity is the historical actuality of persons and events meaning the quality of being part of history instead of being historical myth, legend, or fiction, right? The Bible is the most nonfiction book ever written. It says, the historicity of a claim about the past is its factual status. Historicity denotes a historical actuality, authenticity, factuality, and focuses on the true value of knowledge claims about the past. And that's what the Bible does, all right? There's knowledge claims about the past, the present, and the future, all right? Right now, we're reading about a future prophecy that happened thousands of years ago. It was a future prophecy when Daniel wrote it, but it happened thousands of years ago. So it was the past right now. It's the same thing. When we read about the kingdom of heaven, it's the future right now to us, but in the spirit, it's already happened. In the spirit, Babylon the Great has already been destroyed. In the spirit, America has already been nuked and wiped off the face of the earth. In the spirit, you so-called Negroes, Latinos, and Native Americans are already sitting on thrones ruling. That's why when we're in the spirit, all we talk about is the kingdom. We talk about righteousness. We talk about, oh, in the kingdom, this is going to happen. In the kingdom, that's not going to happen. In the kingdom, in the kingdom. Because our mind is already in the future right now, all right? There are certain events that are going to happen a thousand years from now. We talk about it like it's already happened, man. There's going to be a world with no Edomites. There's going to be a world where, where women are going to be in, in total submission. That's going to be, that's a future to us, but in our mind, it's already happened. Why? Because it's a guarantee, all right? When you have a guarantee of the future, you already, you look at it as if it's already been done. The Lord's already gonna do it, because he said he would. That's the type of faith that we have, because we actually believe in the Bible. We actually believe in the guarantee and the historicity of the scriptures. People that don't have that, they they sorta kinda believe. They say they believe in the Bible, then you bring up what's gonna happen to the so-called white man. They start stuttering, they start looking around, making sure who's watching them. They, they don't have faith in the guarantees. They don't have faith in the historicity. They don't even believe certain men in the Bible even existed. They're that bugged out. Now, while I'm in Daniel, let me get this. This is Daniel chapter 2, verse 31. It says, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head, this image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Now, when you go into this, uh, this description, there's actually been several artistic depictions of this. This actually goes into different kingdoms, different uh, breakdowns of what the, the world that's been here and the world to come, all right? The head was of fine gold. That's talking about Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian empire, all right, which actually existed. It says the breast and his arms of silver. That's talking about the Medo-Persian empire, which we just read about, all right? The belly and his thighs of brass. That's talking about the Greek empire. 
which took down the Medo Persian Empire. Then you have legs of iron. All right, iron goes into the Roman Empire. They were all about iron. They were they were artificers. All right, and the feet part of iron and part of clay. That's talking about this current kingdom. All right, when Rome uh, collapsed, it felt it there was it was partly solid and partly weak. And the same thing happened here in these last days, man. The fourth beast. When you go into these different nations, the EU and the United Nations, they, they're partly strong and partly weak. And you can see in World War III, these nations, they're all going to turn on Babylon the Great. Now, this happened before at the fall of Rome. It's going to happen again in the fall of Babylon. Why? Because the Bible actually contains historicity, man. The fourth beast is actually documented in the scriptures thousands of years, really the Roman Empire, hundreds of years before the Roman Empire, and 2,000 years plus before the, uh, the what do they call it, the Anglo-Saxon the Anglo -Saxon Empire, all right? The British American Empire, the so-called uh, white hegemon, all right? So-called white supremacy, this devil, his tentacles are all over the earth, and it's described in the Bible as the fourth beast. Matter of fact, while I'm in Daniels 2, let me give verse 40. It says, and the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of the potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. The kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And again, that's talking about the Esau strength, man. All right. He he has nations that are strong. He has nations that are weak. And they're all they're all loosely tied together uh, through their hatred of the of Jake, first and foremost, and the other heathen. All right. These Edomites really don't like each other, man. When you go into if you've ever been to Europe, man, listen to how French Edomites talk about American Edomites. They they can't stand these people, man. So they're joined together to because they want to they want to rule. All right. When you look at again, France, you look at what the French did to our people in, in Congo, to our people in Haiti, to our people all over the world. The French are no different than the Spanish. The Spanish are no different than the English. They're all devils. They're all bloodthirsty, violent Edomites. But even though they hate each other, they're joined in this fourth beast, this fourth kingdom. And it's prophesied all over the scriptures. And this actually happened. These future prophecies became history. That's historicity. It says, let me get this real quick. This is 2nd Ezra chapter 11, verse 37. And I beheld, and lo, as it were a roaring lion chased out of the wood. And I saw that he sent out a man's voice unto the eagle. And the eagle, you know, is a symbolic of the Roman Empire. All right, going back into, which is really a phoenix. It says, Hear thou, I will talk with thee, and the highest shall say unto thee, Art not thou it that remainest of the four beasts whom I made to reign in my world, that their end, select you, who I made to reign in my world, that the end of their times might come through them. And the fourth came and overcame all the beasts that were past and had power over the world with great fearfulness and over the whole compass of the earth with much wicked oppression. And so long time dwelt upon the earth with deceit. And again, this is that same fourth beast in Daniel 7, the same fourth beast in uh, uh, what, 2nd Ezra 12. All right, the fourth beast is synonymous with the eagle, and the eagle is synonymous with Edom. Who is Edom? Edom is the descendants of Esau, a man who actually lived, who was an actual uh, red man who walked the earth. All right, this is, this is, this is history, man. We're reading, we're reading patriarchs in the Bible. In Genesis 10, all right, you, you have these, uh, these patriarchs that all nations come from. In Genesis 25, the main nations come from Jacob and, and Esau. And then you, you have this, the kingdoms that come forth from Esau. And the kingdom that's gonna come next is the kingdom from Israel. Why? Because Jacob grabbed the heel of Esau when he was born, man. That's all spiritual and it's all, it's all historical. This world teaches you that, okay, th this right here is spiritual. This, this over here is science. This, this subject over here is history. This subject over here is math. This, uh, no, when you go into the scriptures, it's all the same thing, man. The word, the word math in and of itself, the word math is a Hebrew word, which is a moth. A moth is the truth. So when you study the truth, you're studying science, you're studying history, you're studying the, the spiritual realm. All of these things are true. So this idea, this, this world has us everything compartmentalized, man. When you go into the scriptures, if a man was a farmer, he was also a warrior, he was also a poet, he was also a scholar, he was also a shepherd, okay? King David, uh, need I say more, all right? King David was a shepherd, he was a mighty warrior, all right? King Solomon, he was a psychologist, he was a... <laughs> He got it. He got it in. Okay. He was extremely wise, but he was spiritual. 
all right? That's, that's the legacy that we come from. We don't come from a group of men that are, okay, this guy over here, he's, he's athletic, so he's a dumb jock. This guy over here, he's smart, he's nerdy, so he can only do that. This guy over here, he's good at math, but he, he can't really understand like spiritual things. This guy over here, he's super spiritual, so he's just gonna sit in a lotus position and burn incense all day. He's not gonna get it. No, man, that's not, we don't come from that, man. We come from a, a, a long legacy of men that understood botany, that understood you know the earth, how to maintain creation, okay? In order to maintain creation, you have to be an expert at multiple things, and that's what we're gonna go back to in the kingdom. And it starts with belief in the Holy Scriptures. That has to be your foundation. Your foundation has to be in the guarantee, the promises in writing, and the historicity, the actual truth, the documented, uh, the, uh, per the persons and events that actually took place in the Scriptures. If you don't believe in the people and the events of the Bible, how are you going to believe in the future promised in the Bible? If you don't believe that Jacob and Esau existed, how can you believe in the Israelites and the Edomites? If you don't believe that the, the Greek Empire took down the Medo-Persian Empire, how are you going to believe that Russia, China, and Iran are going to take down Babylon the Great? If you actually believe in, in so-called white supremacy, all right, everybody just living in, in sticks and, and mud huts, then the white man came out the cave with fire, and he just took control of the earth and, and just created this, this beautiful society, and it's going to live forever, you're bugged out, man. Your, your mind is destroyed. When you believe in the doctrines of this world as opposed to the doctrines of the scriptures, you're going to be destroyed because your foundation isn't rooted in the truth. You have to be rooted in, in the law, statutes, and commandments, the promises, the history, and the, uh, the future, man. Everything that's in the scripture, not just one part, not just the Psalms that make you feel good. All right, the Lord is my shepherd. He knows what I, all of that, man. That is, that is a very uh, small-minded, myopic, just tiny like tunnel vision way of looking at the scriptures you're you're picking up the bible to make it say what you wanted to say so that you can feel good about being a degenerate so that you can feel good about being lazy you don't have to go into words you don't have to go into history you don't have to study this you don't have to you can just study you know the the parts of the bible that make you feel good and that's why the lord created these other israelite camps not to get on them or get too off topic but you'll notice their the foundation of their doctrine is my congregation is too dumb to know this, so we're not going to go into this. My congregation isn't, um, they're not spiritual enough to grasp this, so we're not going to teach this. They, they basically have a doctrine of, uh, we're going to pick the parts of the Bible that make so-called Negroes, Latinos, and Native Americans feel good about themselves and, and put on a show, get the fanciest garments, have the fanciest events and gatherings and holy days, and then just put on a show until Babylon is destroyed. All right. If you're a true man of Yahweh Bashim Yahweh Shai, you should have intellectual curiosity. You should want to look into words. You should want to look into history. All right, because that, that boosts your faith. All right, speaking for me personally, I, I had no idea. I never knew about the, the Medo Persians. I never knew about you know, the Babylonian Empire. I never knew about these things until I came into the scriptures. And then when I read it, you read the Lord say He's going to do something, and then He does it hundreds of years later. That boosts my faith, man. History, the historicity of the Bible increases your faith to know that the Lord, the God of Israel, has a track record of saying he's gonna do something and then he does it, that, <laughs> that's incredible, man. That's, just, just imagine someone who every time he says he's gonna do something, you had these uh, different boxers, whether it was Mike Tyson, Roy Jones, they were on a whole nother level. They weren't just champions. They would tell you, okay, in, in this round, I'm gonna knock this guy out, all right? Muhammad Ali, he would predict what round. That's, that puts you on a level of, of being godlike when you can predict the future and then make the future happen that's what our power does the god of israel he says he's going to do something and then he does it no matter how far-fetched it seems you're, you're going to take down the persian empire what yeah, yeah okay all right Th then he does it then he uses a man that is the basis of the earth he uses a, a group of people that couldn't speak a language they were in caves running making sounds <laughs> They, they just learned how to wash, how to bathe themselves a couple hundred years ago. He used the basis of earth to take control of everything, man. That's not something that was, like right now, our people think it's normal that the so-called white man is in rulership. That's not normal at all. If you, told some, if you told anyone in the ancient world that the Edomites were gonna be ruling, the Edomites were gonna have the most, all of the nations in total subjection, they would look at you like you're crazy. But the Most High actually did that. Why? Because he can, he's all about uh, taking one down and lifting one back up, man. He's, he's in control of everything. Everything he does is to show his own sovereignty, to show his own majesty, to prove that he's the one that's ultimately in control. And that's what he's doing right now. He's, he's got the underdogs, the, 
the, the so-called niggas and spicks, the people that society doesn't care about, the people that are downtrodden, the meek of the earth. He actually has the, the rulers of an everlasting kingdom working as truck drivers, as salesmen, as all sorts of just random odd jobs, all right? The actual rules of the earth are at the bottom right now. He's gonna, as a matter of fact, let's, let's get that. Uh, let's get it in, uh, it's all over the scriptures. I'll go to a real quick and easy one. This is the book of Sirach, chapter 10. And this whole chapter is beautiful. I'll, I'll get straight to the point. It's uh, verse 8. It says, Because of unrighteous dealings, injuries, and riches got by deceit, the kingdom is translated from one people to another. And, and that actually happened, man. That's happened before, and it's going to happen again. The Lord, he'll translate the kingdom from one group of people to another to magnify his name. And if you don't believe that that's happened before, if you don't believe in the historicity of the scriptures, then why would you believe that it's going to happen again? Once you understand that the Lord, everything the Lord is about to do, He's done it already, all right? In various incarnations, he's already destroyed the Egyptian empire. He's already delivered his people. So why wouldn't he do it again? When he says, I'm gonna deliver you as, as before in the days of Egypt, if you don't believe that that happened, how, 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 listen, this is plain. If you're reading the prophecy, if the Lord says, I'm gonna do to Pharaoh, I'm gonna do to Esau Edom the same thing I did to Pharaoh, but you don't believe in Pharaoh. You don't believe in the book of Exodus. How are you gonna believe that he's gonna do that again? You can't do something again that you've never done, okay? If the, if the stories in the Bible are fiction, then the future events that are based on those stories would also be fiction. So the so-called white man, he has, to, he has to trick you into believing that these stories never happened. These, these are all fairy tales, these are myths. No, again, the, the word historicity, it says, historicity. Historicity is the historical actuality of persons and events, meaning the quality of being part of history instead of being a historical myth, legend, or fiction. So instead of being a myth, instead of being fiction, the actual people and events spoken of in the scriptures actually took place. And once you understand that that happened, it's nothing for the Most High to do it again, all right? If you live in a world where, when you look at the NBA, right, everybody was wearing those, uh, those young ass pants, they looked like draws, basically it was a bunch of Edomites running up and down the court. It was really boring and weird looking. If you, if you say, hey, there's gonna come a point where so-called Negro is gonna jump from the foul line and he's gonna dunk the basketball. They're gonna be like, what the hell is a dunk? What are you talking about? What do you mean he's gonna dunk from the foul line? It doesn't make any sense. But then once you see someone dunk from the foul line, then you see somebody else do it. Then you see someone else do it. All right, once you see one person do a 360 dunk, okay, that's possible. Then you see other people do it. It's not far-fetched if it's already happened. So the deliverance of the 12 tribes of Israel out of spiritual Egypt and spiritual Sodom is not far-fetched when you understand that the 12 tribes were already delivered out of Egypt in the past, all right? The destruction of Babylon the Great uh, by fire, the same way that, that the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, that's not far-fetched when you understand that he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, that actually happened. So when you have the historicity of the Bible down and you understand these events took place, it's nothing for it to happen again. The Lord destroyed the earth through, through water. He's gonna destroy most of the known world through fire. He's not gonna destroy the planet, all right? but he's gonna destroy this current infrastructure. Everything Esau has his slimy, hairy, red hands on, the Most High is gonna destroy it, and he's gonna set us up on high, man. If you don't believe that, you're bugged out, okay? So, don't need to make this too long. Um, we can end with... Uh, yeah, we can end with, uh, with this Galatians. This is Galatians chapter 3, verse 15. It says, Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Again, the guarantee in writing. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is a Mashiach. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of the Most High and a Mashiach the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. Which again, that goes into uh, 400 years after we went into Egypt, all right? He delivered us out of Egypt. And again, we've been here longer than 400 years. That's gonna happen again, man. So what is there to talk about? If, if you believe in the scriptures, to those of us that actually believe, there is no what if or maybe, it, this is gonna happen. Now, to people that say they believe in the Bible, be, be specific. What do you, 
You, you believe in Psalms. You, you believe in uh, John 3, 16. You believe in scriptures that make you feel good. Or do you believe in the guarantees, the promises and the historicity of the scriptures? These are things we have to be specific about because everyone, again, everyone who's remotely spiritual right now, you see them on the internet. You got these red pill niggas. They're trying to quote Isaiah 4 and 1. You got these, these women. They're trying to quote this and quote that. All right, you got niggas trying to quote, uh, what's the other one, man? <laughs> uh, of course, Psalm, you know, the Lord is my shepherd. But you have just different people that are trying to use biblical passages to, to push a, a worldly agenda. And the, the actual agenda of Yahweh Bashimi Hawashai is to completely wipe this place off the face of the earth and set up the 12 tribes of Israel, his chosen people on high. That's what, that's what we look forward to. That's what our faith is. So Abaratazah, this lesson was edifying to the elect. I'm going to give all praises, honor, and glory to Yahweh, Bahasham, Yahweh Shai, Bahasham, Rechach, Wadash, Double Honesty, Apostles and Elders of Great Millstone, and Shalom to the hopeful elect.